they watch. Them. Time for another show of Captain's Quarters Podcast, and it is April 15th. Wait a minute. Is that tax day, too? Damn. <laughs> no wonder everybody was all upset this past weekend, giving all their money back to the government. Um, April 15th, this is our 130th episode, ladies and gentlemen, and we are working towards having a good number of supporters and subscribers we came up with an idea. We just haven't fulfilled through the idea, but we're going to tell you about it towards the end of the show. As you can see, there's a couple of other people here in the show with us today, and they're going to sit here with us. First, streaming in from Alabama, any of you that know Will the Historian, there he is. There is Will the Historian. That's my son. He is a, a history teacher up in the school district up in Alabama. Are you allowed to say what school district? No, we're going to keep that one a little under lid. Okay. Keep it that way. And then sitting next to me here is Jeff Vane. Now, some of you, let me do it this way, some of you might recognize him because he, at one point in time, worked for Channel 12 News. Yes, in Jacksonville. In Jacksonville. Yep. And he has other jobs now, but we've been friends for about, I don't know, two or three years? Oh, at least. At least two or three years. And we were talking. And tonight's episode is all about the assassination of Lincoln and guess who has a big interest in Lincoln. Not the assassination so much, but he, he's a big Lincoln fan. So. Yeah, but but specifically the assassination. Absolutely. All that led to it and followed it. So our guests are going to sit here with us. Madison Cherry. Hi, that's one of your students, I take it. Yes. yes. Good. I see Chad Cook, the captain of the Queen Anne's Revenge, is on board with us. Welcome aboard. And we will be and Ransom Mayhem from Panama City Beach. He is my brother. I, uh, uh, we do have a lot of family coming in and helping us out, that's for sure. But they're going to sit in with the show here. We'll ask them a little bit more about their cells here. But we, you, everybody knows we have a couple of segments that we must do. And the first one we always do is history, but nowadays history, and the death of people in our lives, celebrities of some sort, some way. Eight Bells is the segment, sponsored by the Riker family of reenactors. They do Spanish reenacting, they do British reenacting, and they are part of the St. Augustine Swashbucklers. They do pirate reenacting. So they are very into the history of this part of Florida and the oldest city in the nation. So we do eight bells. How many do we have tonight, Davey? I know at least one. So how many do we have? Eight. Eight. Oh, you really get me every week on this eight now, aren't you? I think you specifically look for eight. Mm -hmm. All right. So here's how it goes. Davey will throw them up there. We're going to do a little bit of a read on each one of them. If uh, my guests have any comments, by all means, I'll throw the floor out there too. And then at the end, we give them the honor of eight bells. Daniel Guy Whaling was an American song sound engineer. He was nominated for two Academy Awards in the category Best Sound. Whalen is highly, widely considered one of the most prolific and greatest sound engineers of all time. He had worked on more than 500 films since 1965. Working into his 80s, he was 97 years old. I'm not even going to try to pronounce his first name, but everybody knows this is O.J. Simpson. A very controversial man, was an American football player, active and uh, actor and convicted felon. He played in the National Football League for 11 seasons, primarily with the Buffalo Bills, and re is regarded as one of the greatest running backs of all time. And this past week, I have heard several sports commentators on several channels say he is still considered to be one of the best running backs of all time. He acted in movies like the Klansman, the Naked Gun series, and the miniseries Roots. And in the early 1980s, he produced a number of TV movies. He was 76 years old. Trina Robbins 
was an American cartoonist. She was an early she was an early participant in the underground comics movement and one of the first female artists in the movement. She is a member of the Will Eisner Hall of Fame. She was 85 years old. Fred Ingalls Peterson was an American professional baseball pitcher who played in Major League Baseball, MLB, for the New York Yankees, Cleveland Indians, and Texas Rangers from, 90, from 66 to 76. Peterson was a Southpaw starting pitcher who enjoyed his best seasons and best success in 1970 with the Yankees when he went 20 and 11, pitched in the All-Star Games. He is widely known for trading families with teammate Mike Kikish in the early 70s. He had a career record of 131, 133 to 131. He was 82 years old. Aki Bono Taro, Japanese, was an American-born Japanese professional sumo wrestler and professional wrestler from Waimanako, Hawaii, joining sumo in Japan in 1988. He was trained by pioneering Hawaiian wrestler Takayama and rose swiftly up the ranks, reaching the top division in 1990. After two consecutive, uh, you, you, you put this in just to test my Japanese, <laughs> Davey. After two consecutive Yashu, tournament championships in November 1992 and 93. He made history by becoming the first non-Japanese born wrestler ever to reach Yakuzuma, the highest rank in sumo. He died on April 12th. He was only 54 years old. I met Takayami when I lived in Japan in the 70s. He was one of the very first the Japanese actually allowed to have citizenship in Japan so he could be a citizen a sumo wrestler. Japanese are not very open to allowing people come into their, their country as citizens. Mm -hmm. So Robert Breckenridge Ware McNeil OC was a Canadian American journalist and writer, a television news anchor. He partnered with Jim Lear to create the McNeil Lear Report in 75. In 2008, he won the Walter Cronkite Award for Excellence in Journalism. He was 93 years old. Already oh, had. Yes. OC means Order of Canada, which is the highest civilian honor in the country. Oh, very good. See, I we just learned something extra new. Very good. How about this? Eleanor Jesse Coppola, an American documentary film director, screenwriter, and artist. She was married to F director Francis Ford Coppola from 63 until her death. She was best known for her 91 documentary film, Hearts of Darkness, a filmmaker's apocalypse, as well as other documentaries chronicling the films of her husband and children. She was 87 years old. Roberto Cavalletti, I'm not, no, there's no T in there. Cavalli, yes, Cavalli. Italian pronunciation, Roberto Cavalli. I should have read that part. 15 November 1940 to 12 April 2024. An American fashion designer and inventor. He was known for exotic prints and for creating the sandblasted look for jeans. Roberto Cavalli, fashion house sells luxury clothing, perfume, and leather accessories. He was 83 years old. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our eight bell recipients for the week. All have passed on. As always, we like to say we wish their families and their fans good well, and we give them eight bells. with a few more added in there for echo. <laughs> that might have been echoing off of yours there, Bill. Maybe, we'll see, not important. Joke of the week with Mini Mayhem. We remove, wait a minute, I gotta go look at some. Go ahead and do Joke of the Week with Mini Mayhem, sponsored by Salt City Life, or Salt City Comics. <laughs> Sorry, I just got this, this message and I got to see if I can find it real quick. 
somebody in some place, Captain's Quarters podcast group is at risk when we take actions. Uh, somehow we put a post up that somebody didn't like, but it doesn't tell me what the post is. That's really interesting. David LaFold shared a post in the group that went against our rules on adult nudity and sexual activity. Right. Took it down. What did we post? <laughs> Gosh, sometimes, you know, I don't mind if they take something down, Just but tell us what the hell it was <laughs> so we don't do it again. Ah, ah. How did I Money? find out more about it? I, it, it just popped up. I The joys of live performances. Mm. <laughs> All right. We'll go back to what we were doing. Um, Mini Mayhem. That's right. Mini Mayhem. Sponsored by Salt City Comics. He's the one that did all of our new cartoons, our new logo and everything. And, well, let's hear what Mini Mayhem has to say this week. Mini Mayhem here with Joke of the Week. Sponsored by Salt City Comics. How do pirates pay for a round of rum at the pub? Think about it, and I will give you the answer at the end of the show. Did you put a mini mayhem joke up? Did you put mini the one up with the mermaid? Perhaps, but I wouldn't think that would be. Well, who knows? Maybe. We've been doing some mini mayhems where he's been trying to um, uh, have some pirate come on lines for the mermaid. <laughs> That's probably what it is right there. Probably. That's probably what got us in trouble. <laughs> Flirting with a mermaid. Oh, well. We'll always do it every time. Yeah, mermaids will get you each and every time. Very good. So at the end of the, seat, end of the show tonight, we'll, we'll give you the answer to that yeah. joke. Quote of the week by Spyglass Travel. If you want a good walking tour of St. Augustine, see our friends over at Spyglass Travel. You ever taken a walking tour of St. Augustine? You know, I don't think I have. No, it's a... Now, Bill, you haven't been up here for, been down here to St. Augustine for, what, two years now? No, I was down there last summer, remember? Last summer? Yeah. Mind how time flies. Uh, right. June, it was there June, because we did the uh, D-Day. Oh, that's right. That's right. We did D-Day last year. Very good. So next time you come down, we're going to take one of those walking tours. Sounds All good. Right? So, Spyglass Travel, my good friends, Ed, um, Kevin and, and um, Angie Rose, they run Spyglass Travel. And they do a wonderful job taking you around the city, and it's good exercise. And they, they're, believe it or not, they're classified as one of the ten top walking tours in the United States. That. Yeah, that's very good. I'm very proud of them. So go ahead, quote of the week, Davy. You cannot escape the responsibility of tomorrow by evading it today. Abraham Lincoln. That's a good quote. I yes. like that one. Good job, Davy. Davy always finds really good quotes for this. And gives us a chance to just enjoy a good quote. And question of the week, ladies and gentlemen, sponsored by Agent City Sirens. Miss Gina and her dancers, always part of everything that we do with the Pirates of the St. Augustine Swashbucklers. And they do belly dancing, fusion dancing, tribal dancing. And they just did a Harry Potter event this last weekend. I've seen a couple of pictures. It was cute. I haven't talked to her since then, so we'll see what happens. But your favorite president. It's kind of a two-parter. Who's your favorite president? And who do you believe is the most historically significant president to the United States? Now, before the show, or I'm going to throw a few answers here. We kind of agreed it was Lincoln as most significant. Certainly my favorite. Your favorite, for yeah. sure. Uh, I, I believe my favorite is Lincoln also. But it's a toss-up because... I really think the, think a lot of, of Washington, mm -hmm. um, and I believe Washington really was as significant. Lincoln was significant in his time because of what was going on. Mm -hmm. Washington was very significant because it was the start of everything, yeah. and and when certain things could have happened that he didn't believe was good for the country, he manned up and stood down from it and said, we're not, they wanted to make him, I mean, perfect example, they wanted to make him king. Yep. 
And he, he stood there and said, that's not what we did all this for. Right. They were trying and, to get away from all that. We're trying to, we're trying to leave this alone. We got to do it different. Um, it, you know what? When you are the leader of a big group like this and they offer you kingship and you turn it down, that's integrity. That really is. And I, be, I believe that Washington um, is the epitome of what that is. But Lincoln, nonetheless, but when you ask people, I, I, I'm, I'm guessing that almost all of our answers are going to be Lincoln, Washington, and there may be some and with her in my age bracket that will say Reagan. But we'll see what we get for other answers. We'll look look and see if anything pops up there when we're doing the, the bit on, on presidents, Davey or Mandy, go ahead and pop it up there. On that note, we always like to jump into this week in nautical history sponsored by Florida Water Tours. Have you ever taken a boat ride around the Matanzas River? I have. I'm Florida Water yes. Tours has like four different boats and, and it, we've taken, the crew has gone out on, on them twice. Um, one for during the night of lights. It's a great time to see the night of lights from the Matanzas Bay. So Florida Water Tours are good friends over there. They also have an eco-friendly tour for children to teach them about the ecology of our surrounding waters and our inland waterways. And that's very important. Um, so look them up. Florida Water Tours. On that note, Davey, go ahead and hit us with uh, This Week in Welcome Nautical Welcome to This Week in Nautical History. Sponsored by our friends at Florida Water Tours. Experience the intercoastal waterway at its finest, featuring picture-perfect attractions. We begin this week in nautical history in the year 1524. Florentine navigator Giovanni Verrazzano, on a voyage for France, is the first European to discover New York Harbor. 1534. French explorer Jacques Cartier set sail with two ships from St. Malo for Newfoundland, tasked by Francis I to look for gold and riches. 1610. English explorer Henry Hudson departs London, England, aboard Discovery on his fourth, final, and fatal voyage to discover a northwest passage to the Pacific. 1770. British explorer Captain James Cook first sights Australia, writes in his logbook that what we have as yet seen of this land appears rather low and not very hilly, the face of the country green and woody, but the seashore is all white sand. 1845. Whaling ship the Manhattan, captained by Mercator Cooper, is the first ship officially permitted visit Edo, Japan in 220 years, rescuing shipwrecked sailors. 1912, RMS Titanic sinks at 2.27 a.m. off Newfoundland as the band plays on with a loss of between 1,490 and 1,635 people. 1941, Egyptian steamer SS Zamzam attacked and later scuttled by German cruiser Atlantis. All on board are rescued. 1945. U.S. aircraft carrier Franklin heavy damaged in Japanese air raid. 1951. British submarine Afray sank in English Channel killing 75. And finally, in 2004, the superliner Queen Mary II embarks on her first transatlantic crossing linking the golden age of ocean travel to the modern age of ocean travel. And that was this week in nautical history. Utah. Good job, Davey. Good job. We want to do a couple of things on crew adventures. Um, I want to talk about the two events that were this past weekend. Three events, actually. Um, we'll leave out uh, my acting seminar because I still haven't picked dates yet, but sometime in the summer I'm hoping to do at least three, maybe four. But let's talk about the Seawolf Privateers down in Flagler County. They had their murder mystery on Friday and Saturday night. An all-girl crew except for the captain. <laughs> An all-girl crew. There they are. Um, they had the ship. Their ship was known as the, the ship, the PMS. 
believe it or not. <laughs> that was part of the part of the story. And uh, the captain is the prisoner over on the side there. And then these girls and, and the one in the middle gets killed. And we have to decide which one of these culprits committed the dirty deed. Um, I do know that they sold out every ticket for both nights. And I just got a message from them saying that I, and let me make sure I get this right. I don't want to, I don't want to get it wrong. Um, it looks like roughly $11,000 in profit in two nights. That's pretty good. Yeah. And as most of you know, we follow that follow the Seawolf privateers, their money goes to the foster children program in, in Flagler County. And it does branch out into other counties around. So they did really well. They had several, they sold over a hundred and they sold over 230 tickets for two nights. They had several people sign up. They now have a little program where people can make a monthly donation and had several one-time on loan date on online donations as well. So they did really well. This has given them the chance to do their breakfast with Santa for all those children that are foster children. Um, and a few other things that have happened in their favor. They are doing really well. And we are um, very proud to, to be the swashbucklers helping them, the crew of the Seawolf Privateers in their endeavors to what they do. And they're a brand new crew. They've only been around for about three years now. We did, uh, so we, my wife and I went to Friday night's event and then several of the crew members went to Saturday night's event. And the reason I went to Friday night is because on Saturday, I then drove down to Ormond Beach and played golf. Yes, it was the Masters. Go ahead, Davey. Show them a picture. <laughs> there I am golfing. Yep. It was miniature golf. And beware, ye who enter here. There are my good friends, Robert and Emily Farrell from Sanford, Florida. They are also part of the Order of Leviathan. Uh, we were the only three order members that were there for the event. I am told by their captain, Chad Cook, there's me trying to decide what the heck a putter is. <laughs> yeah. But I'm color coordinated. Notice that I picked a red putter to match my outfit. Fashion pirates we are. Ladies and gentlemen, they raised over in a two and a half, three hour event, just a social time. They raised about $3,100. That's pretty good. I am very proud to have been a part of that. And then I drove all the way back up here because I had to be at the oak tree to help the sheriff of our county. And we helped him with that. We were a part, we, we supported that event. And it was Saturday night where the sheriff was making fun, uh, making fundraising for their re-entry program. If you're interested in that, ladies and gentlemen, you should go and find out about it. The sheriff has this re-entry program to help take care of some of the homeless issues we have in St. John's County. Mm -hmm. And it works really well. So there, the sheriff will be on the show sometime this summer, and we do plan on having him talk about his reentry program. And I'm hoping to make plans to do that show with the sheriff sometime the end of July, first of August, because my main focus of conversation will be school safety and traffic school zone safety, because a lot of people can't read signs and whiz through school zones, and we're going to talk about that and uh, maybe talk about how we can stand out there with our blunderbusses and shoot people's windows out. <laughs> why not? Uh, why not? Uh, we're pirates. We can get away with it. But people need to be safe. They really do. And so we're going to have the sheriff on sometime that part of the summertime. Upon that note, that's what we had for the weekend. It was a busy weekend. Lots of pirates doing lots of good for the communities that they're part of. And after all, that's what all these pirate crews are doing now. It's, it's part of the community. So our guests, and we're going into our topic for tonight, Lincoln's assassination. So let's start with those of you that know, Will the historian, that is my son. But instead of me saying a whole lot of flowery words, give everybody a little bit of your background and I'll make sure you include how much you really love and respect your dad. <laughs> Um, oh, let's say I've been really a fan of history all my life, uh, starting with learning about ancient Egypt, and I've figured out how to turn it into a career. 
Um, I really wanted to be Indiana Jones, but realized when I got into college <laughs> that um, uh, the, the Nazis that I wanted to fight weren't the same Nazis. So I kind of had to pick a different style of career. <laughs> so I've uh, been working in ministry. I worked in ministry and then it just kind of led into being a teacher and I've taught all secondary grades, uh, pretty much all social studies topics. And right now I'm a civics and geography teacher. So I teach civics one semester and geography the next. Very good. And for those of you that, that might pay attention, my son is a huge Superman fan. Davey, you got those those pictures ready? Uh, Superman, yes. Okay. So my son this past weekend got to meet, who is that? That is uh, Brandon Routh. He played Superman in 2006, Superman Returns. Yes. And uh, the poster that you had them sign, I saw, I didn't c capture the picture. I gave my son a poster from that movie opening in the casino I was security boss at. I got one of the posters and I sent it to my son and he got him to sign it and autograph it after 20 years. That's yeah. pretty cool. And then my favorite Superman, Dean Kane. And that's your favorite Superman also, right? That is my favorite Superman. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, that, was, that was a joy. Uh, I, I don't get really emotional on a lot of things, but meeting him, and I'm still looking like I've been looking at the pictures from all weekend and the picture where I'm hugging him, where he gives me that bear hug. I still get a little teary eyed looking at and my wife thinks it's kind of funny and adorable. Uh, but this is I mean, this this was my Superman. I watched him for four years. He came into my home every Sunday night. And um, and so I you got have a Superman bromance. Yeah. And he, he really is a, a, a just a nice, wonderful guy um, and just was thankful took time with everyone's fans um and just just that not he had the longest line at the whole thing and there were some big names like george decay and jonathan franks were there and steve burns uh the blue clue steve burns and master chief uh the voice of master chief from the halo series was all there and, i'd, I'd have gotten yeah. george shakai's autograph uh, and this um resident alien series that i just finished watching yeah, George Shakai's voice was the, the voice of the alien that comes down and gives the guy the warning. Well, funny story is that um, one Saturday night when Lauren and I and my my best friend Adam and his wife Charlene we went out to dinner, and we were going to the speak. We went to this uh, like little underground speakeasy. Walking in front of us was George Takai and his husband in downtown Huntsville, out, just out having a good time. And, no, you know, and we didn't we didn't go up to him or anything like that because, you know, I mean, I'm not going to do that public. They're out trying to enjoy and relax and have a right. good time. Uh, but that was just kind of cool to kind of see them, see them out there, you know, and uh, uh, they were he was out there and a lot of people got, got his autograph line was pretty big, too. Yeah. So, very cool. Where was that at? Birmingham? No, uh, no it, was in, it was in Huntsville. Huntsville. All right. Yeah, they have been doing it nine years, and they've had some big names. They had William Shatner last year. Um, I said John and Franks this year. Huge names. Well, uh, I work know. with the Asian City Con out at World Golf Village. We'll see what the names are this year. And our second guest, ladies and gentlemen, sitting here beside me in studio is Jeff Vane. We've been friends for several years now. And finally, I've convinced him. I picked a subject that could get him on the show. Tell everybody a little bit about yourself. Yeah, well, the way we've known each other, I used to work at First Coast News, which is one of the network affiliates in Jacksonville. Um, and so I have a media background, but I, I, I work for a tourism company now here that has a headquarters office here in St. Augustine and uh, love working for them. But for me, really, my tie to this, as you're alluding to, is, uh, you know, a funny thing happened back when I was about 10 years old. <clears throat> I already knew and, and admired Abraham Lincoln, but I started to learn a lot more about his assassination and the story of what led to it and a lot about what followed it, meaning in the following, oh, 12 weeks or so, really, if you want to count it to the day, 12 weeks following the night he was shot. Um, a whole lot happened that that rocked the world and certainly the United States. And it rocked my world when I was just 10 years old, reading about this, learning about this. Four people were executed. One was the first woman ever executed by the U.S. government. And the stories of each of those individual people and their part or alleged plot, uh, part in the plot. Um, but it, to me, and, and by the way, I, 
I could be corrected on this. I don't know. But this is a book, um, one of many great books about it. But uh, this, there are pictures of that execution. And I would surmise that that is the first execution, at least legally sanctioned execution ever photographed in human history. I could be wrong about that. I, I stand to correction, but I think that might be the first execution ever photographed. Well, that would be an interesting point to try to figure out and see. Uh, you might be right because photography was just coming into the world at, or just prior right, to the yeah. American Civil War. So you might actually be right. I know that um, it's kind of off subject, but there are many documented pictures of gunfighters in the 1800s, late 1800s, when they were shot, they displayed them and took pictures of them. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they actually, you, you paid to have your picture taken with a dead body. Yeah. It was a big thing because photography was a big thing. So, so if anybody is wondering, um, a hundred, how many years ago? 159? To the day. To the day. He was shot on the 14th, which would have been last night. Yep. At what time? About quarter past 10. Uh, and then he dies the next morning on the 15th. Yeah, about 7.20. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. So, and he dies the next morning on the 14th at about um, 7.22 in the morning. Is yeah. that what we got? From the That's day? what the historians say. Yeah. yeah. So um, let's start with this question. Was his assassination the main focal point that really destroyed any left credibility with the South? Oh, I got a good one there, didn't I? That is a great one. That's a great one. Um, I don't think so. No, no. really? Yeah. But, and, and why? Well, I don't want to jump the gun on uh, on Will, because um, you might have. I don't, I, I'm agree. I don't think so, too. But what I do think it did, it allowed for the group known as the radical Republicans to get a better foothold and control of reconstruction and punish the South than what Lincoln wanted to do. And a Andrew Johnson, you know, wanted to follow Lincoln's path. Um, and he just, and they just, the radical Republicans tied up Andrew Johnson, a lot of it because he was a Democrat. Um, and so I think, th I think what it did, what it allowed, it allowed a political entity to come in and kind of take control and, punish south and they, they i'm not gonna say they did it just because oh well lincoln lincoln was assassinated and you know this guy had sympathies for the south i think they 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 really even before that there's documentation where it says that there were senators that wanted the south to pay pay dearly for for this war so and, maybe they did it out of revenge more than anything else well the thing that i that i remember reading many times is how Booth fancied himself a hero and that once he got across the Potomac River, he would be, there would be parades in his honor and, and happily ever after. And it was quite the opposite. And there he is right there. By the way, he was a very famous, very famous actor. We were talking before the show about how he was loosely the equivalent of Brad Pitt today. And that is not an, ex that's, that's not an exaggeration except stage versus movies, but I digress. The thing about that is that once he and his accomplice, David Harold, got over into Virginia, they found that, uh oh, no, 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 people were not speaking highly of him. And one of their concerns in general was that that this was, that he was going to cost the South any kind of mercy based on having killed Lincoln. Booth was going to cause that, cause that, 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 that the, sentiment. Yes, yeah, that, that it was going to, he was basically throwing the South under the bus in terms of any reparation or the reconstruction efforts and so forth, whether that was going to be accurate or not, that was apparently a very, very broad fear in the South. Well, Lincoln's, let me see how I want to put this. Lincoln, before his assassination, he was torn up about the split the, the, uh, of, of our country. And yeah. he was constantly, constantly trying. I mean, if you watch the movie that, um, uh, Daniel Day Lewis plays Lincoln. That's a very good movie. Yeah, it's actually Lincoln. called Lincoln. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. very good. And Lincoln really was concerned with when he gets this war done, how is he going to heal this country and bring them back together? That was part of its focal point. So when when he dies, these other people now that are that are in more control, they don't follow Lincoln's path, as you say, and they're a little bit 
harder on everybody. Well, there was yeah. an interesting moment right after, uh, just days before the assassination, which was only a day or two after the surrender at Appomattox. Yeah. Lincoln stood out on the balcony of the White House and gave an un unannounced but impromptu speech to a huge throng of people, which I believe this same speech was attended by John Wilkes Booth. So there's two parts of this. One, which I think is a vestige of how conciliatory Lincoln was, he asked a band that was there, literally, he said, somebody asked him, do you have a piece of music you'd like for them to play, for us to play? He said, I'd like you to play Dixie. It's always been one of my favorite songs. Would he have done that if he had a vindictive heart? I don't think so. Right. So, but the other thing is, as a side note to that is, if it is the same speech, Booth turned to somebody next to him and said, that's the last speech that man's ever going to make. Ooh. And it was true. Wow. It proved true. Wow. So... Will, you made you made some really great notes here. Um, one of the notes is that this manhunt, because we talked about it real quick, they put 10,000 troops on this manhunt yeah. to look for Booth and bring him to justice. That's a lot of manpower. And it took them seven days to find him? 12. 12 days to find him. And then we have here that the trial... So 12 days is two, almost two weeks. And then we have somewhere in here, I saw the notes that the trial was seven weeks long. It's about right. It's yeah. The trial took seven weeks, 366 witnesses. So seven and two, that's nine. But And you said earlier, this whole thing was about 12 weeks long. Well, the execution took place oh, the 12 execution? weeks to the day right. after the assassination. There you, so there you go. Okay. So that... There's your time frame there. 12 weeks, that's three months. Three months yeah. that this country is main focal point is on the assassination of Lincoln and what do we do with the people that did it? Pretty much. Yep. Very much so. So throw something in if you want. Um, well, yeah, again, you said you said it was 10,000 men. I think it's still, um, you can correct me from, I think it's still considered probably the largest manhunt that has ever happened in, 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 in history for one person. Um, and some of the stuff, you know, like when you're reading about the after effects, like the trial, it wasn't a, it wasn't a civilian court trial. It was a military tribunal and the Supreme court was already hearing cases and just trying to decide whether or not civilians should be able to be tried in a military court tribunal. And later in 1866, Supreme court would pass a ruling that said that civilians cannot be tried in a military court because it's not they're pro they're not getting a fair shot, and but all these conspirators were tried by military tribunal, uh, and so they so some wonder if they were given a fair shot um, or were they given a fair trial under constitutional law, uh, and some say like uh, Mary who was the first woman executed, in America would she have been executed if they would have been able to capture her son, John, first. You know, mm -hmm. there's this theory, you know, that they wouldn't have executed her. They would have, you know, put it all on him and executed him because, you know, he would, you know, he would be caught, but, you know, <laughs> his trial would, would take a little bit longer and he would just be more of a conspirator and uh, get jail time. So you know, the four people, uh, before we go any further, David did some looking. Facebook removed our advertisement for tonight's show based on the fact that we use the word assassination. I know they removed tonight's show off of Facebook, the current live. Really? Yes. So we're, so yeah. Yeah. It's, it's an AI feed thing where they caught the word assassination, which shows up as violence. And so it was flagged out. Um, YouTube has not flagged it currently. <sighs> Wow. I'll be so writing they, a letter to Facebook and telling them what an ass they are. Even on even on an anniversary. Well, yeah, that's, we're doing a, a, a historical anniversary of a significant part of the United States of America's history, and they want to play games. Wow. I'd hate to see what they do if we ever did a show about uh H. H. Holmes and you know him being a murderer. <laughs> It's just how you labeled it. If they had titled it The Death of Abraham Lincoln, it would have slid past everything. The word assassination created the, the red flag. But how arbitrary can you get? 
I mean, how 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 ridiculously oh, no, no. realize I'm a realtor. If you want to see ridiculousness of word verbiage, yeah, we can't use like half the words in our things. And actually, in Nevada, I was typing up a listing for a vacant land, and I got flagged for the word vacant. So, they, so. our show is not this show is not available on our Facebook page at all tonight. Correct. They pulled wow. it. The live show while we were doing it, it flagged. See, Try resharing it now that I changed some stuff. What's that? Try resharing it now that I altered some stuff on the back end. <laughs> so Dean Warmer dropped the big one. Wow. For oh. those who get that reference. Yeah. yeah. How, how, how just simply asinine and aggravating is that? Yeah. Mm. that I is. Mean, wow. I, I, I don't even have any other words to say. I, I, I do, but that'll probably get this show knocked off too. So I'll, I'll be nice about it tonight. But I just knew this watching too. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but we're still here so far. If but, things go black, ladies and gentlemen, you'll know why. <laughs> but I will say, but, like, in talking with the, about the trial, I've always been more fascinated with the actual event. You know, the trial, I, I mean, I read a lot of manuscripts and everything when I did my paper in college, but I was always more fascinated with the timeline and the events that happened on the night of the 14th and right before that. Um, like reading about the conspiracy that it, they were trying to maybe kidnap Lincoln. And the reason that plot falls down is because, well, the war ends, Richmond's captured and App the surrendered at Appomattox. So Booth kind of went, a fringe and decided to change it up. You know, they were going to blow up the White House and try to capture Lincoln. And, you know, that would have been able to get the South a little bit more time and maybe in the war differently. But like, just like some of the things that take place, like, you know, Grant was supposed to be at the, at the theater with him. And instead it was another officer and his fiance. And a lot of people say, well, Grant had family in town, but if you read other things, Ulysses S. Grant hated Mary Todd because some things that is recorded that Mary Todd had said <laughs> that she thought he, she was flirting with Lincoln, you know, <laughs> and it's, and then when you get into it, that Lincoln wasn't the only target, you know, secretary of state Seward, um, Andrew Johnson was a target, you know, that they were well, trying to pretty Andrew much Johnson cripple the whole Johnson. government. Yeah. Which, yeah. And, you know, it didn't all work. And Lincoln's the only one who lost his life that night until, you know, Booth, you know, 12 days later. But the, but the reason why that is the case is two things. The reason Johnson didn't get assassinated, there's that word, um, was because George Atzerodt, who would hang at the end of one of those ropes, there he is. He's a German Im immigrant, by the way, a carriage maker. He lost his nerve and he got drunk. That's simple. If we're going to put it in brass tacks, that's what happened with that part of it. Yeah. Now, Lewis Powell, who was a Florida boy, and his, his skull is buried in, uh, there's Lewis Powell, big, big brute of a guy, young guy, 20 years old, and uh, quite a stoic guy, by the way. Um, and anyway, he was assigned to kill Seward. So that's part of, that, the whole idea was that, okay, we're not kidnapping Lincoln because we can't use him as a bargaining chip anymore, yeah. but maybe we can reignite the war. This is Booth thinking, or maybe even saying we can reignite this and turn, basically do a do-over if we decapitate the U.S., the Union yeah. government. So Lincoln, and he wanted that one because for a lot of reasons, he was a, he was a showman. Uh, but Powell goes to Seward's house. And the only reason he didn't kill Seward was because Seward had a neck brace on from a carriage crash a couple of weeks prior. And literally, he's on top of the guy. <laughs> stabbing him in his in his yeah. bed and, and the neck brace deflected the, the knife blows so anyway that, that's, wow. the, that's the short and it, some interesting i found out of uh, going back and researching pal pal is actually is has ties to alabama he was born here in alabama that's right and yeah. um and uh, it's funny because i was talking to someone where he was born now he didn't they moved to georgia and stuff but you know he was also you know there's there's a lot of there's with Powell, some people say he was AWOL because we know he was captured and, and then escaped. Some say he went AWOL. Some say he was actually part of like a spy agency for the Confederacy. And that's why and he and, you know, why he was in with Booth and everything, because a lot of people believe Booth was, you know, in some instances was was part of the spy Confederacy ring. Um, and that's how Booth. That's 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 one of those hearsay, you know, could certain evidence point to that? Yeah. But do we know for for 
true for facts, you know, that's one of those things, you know. But pal, yeah, pal, pal was a young man and made some bad choices and got <laughs> and he paid with it with his life at an execution. But but he was impassioned in his cause and what whatever you think about the Civil War in the South versus the North. I can't help but admire the man for his his stoicism, his courage, his bravery. And he lied about his age so that he could get so they can enlist. He was that chomping at the bit to to join the fight. And to me, that says a lot about him. And, and even the people who guarded him in, in before he was executed had a lot of good things to say about him. And he about them, too, by the way. So he's the one that he pretty much accepted his fate mm -hmm. in a for lack of a better word, a manly sort of way. He was he was a soldier, soldier. They they say he walked to the gallows like a king on his way to being coronated. Now the other three, if I may, some of the stuff that that where I think it gets really interesting and, and subject to speculation is okay, was what degree did Mary Surratt have a part of yes. this? As well as Samuel Mutt. Yeah. whose descendants to this day have been working forever to clear his name. Now, so if any of them happen to ever see this, forgive me, but everything I've read, first of all, I can't believe that Mary Surratt didn't know anything about it. Her son, she she got executed because of her son, John. He was involved with the plot. He and Booth were thick as thieves, and John Surratt just happened to be able to escape to Canada, and yeah. then a, they became a part of the papal guard over in Rome, that's where he was found two years later and brought dragged back to the U.S. Hung jury. He went free and died in the 1900s. Yeah. And he even tried to do a, a lecturing tour that did kind of fell flat for him. But anyway, I digress. But and you were talking a little bit about this, Will, uh, or at least I think you're alluding to this. There's the question of would would Mary Surratt have been executed had she, had she been tried in a civil court? Had they all been tried in a civil court? I think she was used as bait. Yeah. I think that basically she was sentenced this way and held up. They were hoping that that her son would come out of the woodwork uh, instead of being the chicken that he was, because I, I think he was an absolute dirtbag. And he let his mother die while he ran off at, for his crime. Now, she owned the boarding house where they all met, which is how she got tied into it. Yeah. Booth and David Harold, on the night of the when they were escaping D.C., their first stop, well, their first stop was in Surrattsville, Clinton, Maryland today to get shooting irons. Their next stop was the home of Dr. Samuel Mudd in the wee hours because Booth jumped out of the box. His spur got caught in the flag. He lands awkwardly, fractures his shin, stumbles to the center of the stage and holding the bloody knife he'd used to, uh, to, to stab that guest Robert and said, six semper tyrannis, thus ever to tyrants, makes his way out the back. Anyway, they get out to the countryside and they go to Samuel Mudd's house. Well, Samuel Mudd's defense was, I didn't know. Well, he might not have known what had just happened hours prior. There's Dr. Samuel Mudd. But yeah. here's what we do know. Dr. Samuel Mudd and John Wilkes Booth knew each other pretty darn well. They had met at least three times prior to any of this going on. There are a few other things about Samuel Mudd. He was definitely, he lived in Maryland, but he was a Confederate sympathizer and a big one. And so... And they and he knew eventually, if not in the first five minutes, he knew who, whom he was treating. Anyway, Dr. Mudd missed the gallows by one vote. It was a nine-member tribunal, and he missed the, the gallows by one vote. He and the others who weren't executed got sent down to the Dry Tortugas, Fort Jefferson, which is about 400 miles south of where we are sitting in St. Augustine, for all but one of them for a lifetime imprisonment. None of them was there for more than four years, and one of them died while they were there. So, but my defense of the Hippocratic Oath mm. was worthless to the, to, the, to the jury then. They didn't. Aiding and abetting an assassin of the United States president, I think probably supersedes. I, I, would, I would guess that's probably their thinking. And, and especially if it's, okay, it's a broken leg. Well, and look, if they, if they didn't, if they hadn't known each other, and I'm, everything I'm saying is, Speculation. speculation. Yes, absolutely. This is like ghost stories. Ghost stories, a yeah. lot of this can never be fully proved nor disproved, but there's a lot to chew on here. So, and I, I'm taking a lot of the floor here right now. So, right. but that, so those are some of the most fascinating elements of this. But I got to admit, the hanging itself, God, when I was 10 years old and saw these pictures, I'm, 
I didn't even know capital punishment. I had no idea of the concept. And I was, I was pretty, I moved off center by all that. Just so, so that. Well, I was going to say, one of, well, one of the things that about Mud though, was that a lot of people don't believe Mud knew about the assassination, but Mud knew about the kidnapping. And the reason that is because Powell actually came out and said that many of that, that he and Anderson didn't know about the assassination until the night was going to happen. Now, that, that, he, he's on record for saying that. Whether or not that's true, I think that that, that seems kind of weird, you know. And it, well, it makes sense for um, makes sense for Azeroth why he would chicken out and maybe Powell kind of being as crazy as he was, you know, for, but at the same time, how do you not plan something like this? But that would make sense to why, but I mean, that's, he knew about the kidnapping and then he fixed Booth. He fixed Booth's like goes into town to run errands while Booth is sleeping and finds out all about this. And some say that at either he helped him escape or kicked him out of the house you know, <laughs> say, get off my property. So had, had he turned him over to the authorities, that would have been a yeah. completely different story. That, yeah. And that's the thing that got him. He did not go, you're going to the authorities. That probably would have saved Mud everything. So um, this entire discussion, a lot of what we're talking about, because as we've mentioned the word speculation several times, yeah. Yeah. when I do tours of, of the museum and pirate tours, I always tell people on my tours that prior to the invention of recording devices and camera equipment and camera equipment's right here, right now, yeah. everything we know about history is not absolute. It's based on the written word. We have the written word, the court trial, the court testaments, the court documentation. You have other pieces of, of, of the puzzle and you put it together, but you still end up speculating like we have on what would have happened if this had happened, or maybe it happened this way. We don't know for sure. I mean, I'll use um, Mary Surratt. Mm -hmm. They did not, according to what I've heard now and what I've seen, they never proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that she was responsible in any way. Yeah. She was just the mother of somebody. And so they go on the assumption, well, it's your son, you should have known. So you're guilty. It was her boarding house where they met. And yep. as they said at the trial, she was she owned the nest that hatched the egg. Uh, and, okay. and so uh, guilty by association, basically. Well, and, and 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 at least possibly a bargaining chip to get her son. And that's pure speculation. But to get to get him to come out of the woodwork, by the way, a quick word. But it didn't work. No, no, it, no, it didn't. No, it didn't work. No, no. He was he was a coward. Yeah. Uh, a quick word in favor of my, uh, Dr. Mudd, and this has nothing to do with his involvement. I think he was involved. I think he knew. He wasn't involved in the plot per se, but I think he knew darn well what was going on. At least he knew enough. But when he was down in the Dry Tortugas, remember he was a doctor, of course. Yeah. Yellow fever broke through that place and for a long time was not solved. Nobody knew what was going on. And, the, and to, by the way, if you haven't been gone to the Dry Tortugas in Fort Jefferson, I don't care who you are or where you are, Go there sometime at least once in your life. It is utterly phenomenal. 70 miles west of Key West. Okay, but so he's a doctor. He saved lives, not just of other prisoners, but of some of the guards who were guarding him and others. So a lot of several guards wrote letters to President Johnson saying, give that man clem that man clemency. And it wasn't just he, but in 1869. All of them, well, one of them died there of yellow fever, um, Michael O'Laughlin. Yeah. But Sam Arnold, Ed Spangler, um, who held Booth's horse for him, um, and, uh, and Dr. Mott all got sent home. That was the end of their sentence, even though three of them had gotten a lot, life at hard labor. And that was a horrible place to be. It's a beautiful place. But it was a horrible place to go for a life of hard labor in those days. No air conditioning. Uh, anyway, I could go on and on. But So that's one... That's one for Dr. Mudd. So he cut his sentence down because he did what he's supposed to do. He's a doctor. Yeah, but he could have easily refused and said, I'm a prisoner here. Why should I? I'm no longer a well, doctor. Well, that's true. He, you could know, have. He, he, he could have. He could have very easily. So I am looking at some notes here. Um, and one of the things, so there were four people hung. Yes. Yeah. How many people also, how many did not hang but serve, serve time? I've heard another, another four. four. So yeah, four. Eight total in this whole conspiracy. 
Well, no, because remember, if Surratt or Booth had gone to trial, they would have swung, guaranteed. Okay. Oh, all right. And the oddity is that if if John Surratt had gone to trial and hanged, which he would have, maybe his mother wouldn't have. Don't know. So, let's go to Booth now. Booth is, and I know Davey's got the picture of the farmhouse. So they track him down. They find him. Yeah. Is the word supposed to be that they, he's supposed to be brought back alive? He told. He said he wouldn't be. He yelled from inside the barn. He, was, he would not be taken. He and David Harold, who was one of those hanged, um, Harold surrendered. They had the, the barn surrounded. But the, by the way, this the Garrett farmhouse is long since no longer there, and there's n there's only a tiny vestige of it. This is about 45 minutes south of D.C. on a secondary highway. You never know it's there unless you go there to like to the GPS coordinates and and look for the little. Has it all been destroyed because yeah, of this? There's, there's, I don't know if it's because of it, but the, this building, the home, the garret, any of that, there's it's woods. It's nothing but woods there. Uh, but yeah, coming back to the question, Booth said he would not be taken alive, and he and sure enough, he he they called his bluff. They set so, the barn on fire. So they set the barn on fire, and he died from the fire. He did no. not. He died no, from no. a bullet. Yeah. No, so, yeah. Was it, go uh, ahead. Go ahead. Well. Um, yeah, he he did. They well, they surrounded. And the story that I have always uncovered was there was a uh, officer known uh, uh, Officer Corbett, and he yes. could the way he tells it, he see he sees Booth in there, and you know Booth had been saying like, "Hey, send all your men away, and let's just fight." He like telling the officer, you know, like we'll, we'll fight this out. Yep. <laughs> and he sees, and when he when the when fire is lit, he sees Booth going up, and in some cases they say he saw his gun, but Corbett shot him. Because he thought, because well, I'm protecting the rest. I'm protecting my fellow officers. And then Corbett got sixteen hundred dollars for being the man who shot Booth. Yeah, um, he got some kind of money. He got got a little reward there. And then Booth would, you know, Booth would would go on to, you know, depend. There's a lot of different ways things people said he said, like, you know, pointless or it is fit, you know, you know, things he said. But he would they'd move him to like the porch. Yep. And he would, he would he would linger on for a couple more hours and die from what I understand very painfully. Yeah, um, he he lasted until about daybreak. Now this yeah. happened in the wee hours, so he lasted till about sunrise. Um, the bullet had entered his his head at right behind the ear, about pr almost precisely the same spot where his bullet had entered Lincoln's head. Oh, really? And a lot of people speculated. Okay, well this is just you know, divine justice, and, yeah. but but what the well, Lincoln was unconscious uh, yeah. from that very moment. Booth wasn't. He was, but he was paralyzed. Um, and so, yeah, he was. Well, you're right. He was carried to the porch. And at one point, the last thing he said, he asked, "Can somebody hold my hands up to my face?" And he could barely speak, but he somebody holds his hands up, and he says, "Utterly useless." Yeah. And that was the end. That was the last thing he said. And and uh, there was more something more about that. I was just thinking of, but. Um, yeah, just to be like for a little bit of detail. So Boston Corbett, the soldier who shot him, how do they shoot him? Well, if they're all outside the barn, Booth's inside, uh, and he's working with a crutch, by the way, in one hand and a gun in the other. And yeah, so the, the, the story went according to, to Corbett that he saw him moving for the door and he didn't want for Booth to be able to shoot any of the other soldiers. So, and there was a, how do they see him? He was looking through a gap in between the yeah. plant and he was also able to draw a bead on him and, he said he was aiming to injure and incapacitate. Well, he got the bonus plan. He killed the guy. Wow. Well, and right. I mean, there is there is the speculation. While everyone said that you know they were trying to get him alive, <laughs> there was speculation that they were never going to take him alive, um, and that led to a lot of the, the the conspiracies of well, who in the government was involved in this? Like, if Johnson was involved in this, why wouldn't he want him to have him dead? I mean, it it fueled. The, the conspiracy ideas of who was really involved in this plot to kill Lincoln. That that feeds that feeds the, the exact same idea of the story of Blackbeard. Blackbeard was basically assassinated because certain people didn't want to be known as his conspirators. Mm -hmm. So that that that's a common um, thought process uh, that leads many conspiracy conspiracy theories. If they'd have brought Booth back to trial, would it have opened up a whole lot of other people's dirty laundry? 
Yeah. And I'm, yeah, bet, I'm, I'm betting it would. it would. It really would have because, like, anything going – I mean, look at – we always try not to be too political, especially with what's going on in, in today's world. But look at all the, the stuff that's going on today. Every time they open another door, three more spiders step out. It, it's, it's just really – Government conspiracies are are normal. That that reminds, I, it reminds me of the phrase "nothing new under the sun." Human motivations and the things that move them. True, <laughs> very true. I have a question for you, Will. Yes. In your notes, five judges in the tribunal. How many judges were there? Because five judges, you say, asked for clemency for the for the for uh, Barry Surratt. Well. Did President Johnson have override of all those judges? Um, that that's going to be a little bit, but I'm just that is just what I read. Um, I think Jeff might be able to say a little bit more about. Are there more than five. I'm judges not great upon the military tribunal. As now, well. see, from my military history, tribunals were usually seven judges. I want. I'm thinking nine for some reason. I, I could nine. be wrong. Yeah. But here's this is so related. What was interesting, and, and can you imagine being Mary Surratt? Now, by the way, none of them, these four knew that they were going to be executed. There's Mary Surratt. She was in her, I want to say, mid forties when she was when she died. Now, she, they didn't know until the day they were executed Friday, July seventh. They didn't get told they were going to be executed until Thursday, July sixth. Wow! And they're in their cells, listening to the gallows being built all through the night. That would hang them the next day. Um, it was, I think, it was morning of the seventh that a writ of habeas corpus came across to give the body, give the habeas corpus meaning give up the body literally. But we're talking about a live human being in this case, of course, to hand her over to civilian authorities. What they would have done with her, you know, we've talked about that a little bit. What yeah. speculation? But that writ, somebody, so her. Her attorney comes in and says, we got a rid of habeas corpus for you. And then it gets overridden by President, the now President Andrew Johnson. So she gets told, you're going to die all less than 24 hours. You're going to hang tomorrow. The next morning, I believe it was, she's told, you're off the hook. You're going to, at least for the moment, habeas corpus. And then within an hour or two after that, she finds out, no, you are going to hang. And can you imagine just the, 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 Mental anguish uh, for a person guilty or not. The mental roller coaster of that seven or eight hours before the hanging has got to be terrible. And for her family. And now the Surratt family was a fairly prominent family in, in, in this area. Yeah, um, they, they lived in, uh, in fact, they. Because they had a town named after them. Yeah, Surrattsville, which is now Clinton, Maryland. But yeah, so, I, and I believe her husband was like the postmaster general in that, in that vicinity. So they were of some standing there. Yeah. And they had a boarding house out in the country, as well as the one in the city, which is where the conspirators were meeting. Yeah. Um, so they they, they, they were some means for sure. Yeah. yeah. Wasn't their other boarding house like just like right down from Ford's Theater? A couple oh. blocks away. I've forgotten the street. Ford's Theater is on 10th Street. Um, I've forgotten the street, but it's, I, it's only a handful of blocks away. Yeah. It's now, well, last I knew it was a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> but the building's still there. So a couple of conspiracies that you threw into your notes that I yeah. thought interesting. So um, Mary Todd believes that VP Johnson was involved in all of this. Yeah. Um, she was so outspoken about that that it pretty much made her a pariah in, in society. Um, but she was, oh, sorry, she I'm was, sorry. She was all, and I mean, and she was already, um, well, as they would look at it, like <sighs> crazy. But, you know, the more and more you read about Mary Todd that, she more than likely suffered from bipolar mm -hmm. uh, when you look at it. So, you know, something they couldn't treat then, something that we could very much, very help with and treat now. So she, you know, she would have these moments just, you know, and, but she, and she was very outspoken, very outspoken about some we of that. have a similar historical character in St. Augustine's history. Uh, one of Flagler's wives was considered to oh, be. Oh, yeah, had, had mental health had issues. Had mental health issues, yeah. too. Mary Todd, uh, she, she was committed to a sanitarium years later, but consider, and also she drove Congress crazy because she loved spending money. Oh my Lord, did she love spending money in the White House? So let's decorate this this way. She was pretty famous or infamous for that. But consider for a moment, 
that they had four sons. Yeah. Only one of them lived to adult. No, well, yeah, only one to adulthood. So yeah. Willie Lincoln died 12 years old during the Civil War. He physically died in the White House. Yeah. Uh, you had um, not well, Robert was the only one who, and he lived to prominence as well as uh, adulthood. Uh, Edward, Edward Baker Lincoln, um, he, he died in infancy. And yeah. Tad Lincoln uh, lived to, who, by the way, was at a play at the National Theater a couple blocks away. He was watching Aladdin being performed while his father was being shot at Ford's Theater. And he was all of maybe 10 or 11 years old. Um, and he only lived till, I think, 17 years of age. So long way of saying, Mary Lincoln lost three of her sons. I think that would probably test anybody's fire. So. Yeah, and then her husband, you know, I mean, so. And um, her husband, yes, yeah, of course. That, that, that could put, that could put it on, and, oh, I am in no way, you know, going after Mary Todd. I think that. Well, no, 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 I'm, yeah. yeah you know. But, Mary you know, I, and I think, I think if she was bipolar, which is not a negative thing was, and then to experience these things, prob, you know, that's just, just like, you know, the iceberg keeps falling, you know, and keeps falling on her. And she, I mean, she was so distraught. She didn't even go to Lincoln's funeral. She was bedridden, you know. Here's somebody that just posted for us. Um, Jim is one of our staunch listeners and followers and he'll, he'll pop up with something. So he, that, where'd it go? Get up there. There were nine judges um, at the trial for Mary Surratt, five recommended life, but Johnson declined to spare her life. Thank you for that. Okay, yeah. yeah. So it's, thank it's, you, Jeff, for that one. If you're the commander in chief, that you're probably going to be able to tell a military tribunal. <laughs> well, I guess that's that, that's that's one way to look at it. He is a commander in chief and has has control or he, he lords um, uh, power over the five judges, the nine judges. So um, I guess you're absolutely right. But it had to be really controversial that, that they, I mean, after the fact, when they, when they hung her, did it cause controversy throughout the country because they hung a woman? Yeah. Well, it was a sensitive thing, but even the executioner tied only five knots in her rope instead of seven, partially because it was late in the day and he didn't think she was going to die. She didn't think she was going to hang. So uh, even the people guarding and, and overseeing the execution thought, she's, there's no way. There's no way she's going to be hanged. And so it surprised everyone, I think. But by the way, I think part of the argument for what, or the biggest maybe argument for why a military tribunal was that it was being treated, at least by the ones making the decisions, as an act of war. An act of war, of course, yes, war. Because, yeah. because of what was going on. Yeah. Um, and so they execute the four. They put four in prison. Are the, so that's eight. Is there anybody else in all of this that suffered any punishments or ill fate that we know of? Or is it just these four that took pretty much the brunt of everything? Yeah, the only ones I would add to it, and again, are just but they're obviously sort of as a sidebar, even though they were important to it, was John Surratt and, of course, John Wilkes Booth. But they, they met their fates other ways. Right, right. So um, this conspiracy theory is the one that, that, that I have read about and I like um, that people believe that Secretary of State Edwin Stanton w was behind a lot of the plans of all this because he didn't agree with anything that uh, Lincoln did as far as post-war war policies. And Stanton didn't have security alerted at Navy Yard Bridge over which Booth escaped uh, mysteriously tele telegraphing communication and alleged having Booth killed instead of standing trial. And some accused Stanton of removing pages from Booth's diary. Have you Plain. heard that one? I've heard it, but um, it, it, I don't know. But it's exactly playing to what we were talking. You were talking about earlier is all those motivations, and that we'll never know. Yeah, but they sure are. They're fun to sit around and talk about, you know, and kind of speculate, yeah. as it is with any his any history. Um, when you look at anything, there's things you could speculate and look at. Um, and there's things that are fact. There are things that we know happen. Like, uh, like they're pretty much, pretty much saying, yeah, that the kidnapping plot was true because they captured days before an actual bomb expert who said he was there to blow up the White House. You know? Yes, I've got some notes here too. Thomas Harney, um, yeah. a noted bomb expert, but he was captured before he could do anything. 
So yeah. that's an interesting point. I've got another question because in my knowledge, I, I could be very wrong here. Grant becomes president after Johnson, correct? I believe, yeah, I believe that. It's, it's Lincoln, then Johnson, then Grant, right? I believe, I, I think so. Right. So wasn't, wasn't Grant responsible for creating the Secret Service? Not yes. Lincoln? Yes, he was. So you, there's a reference in here that the Confederates already had a Secret Service. A and spy, they, yes. Yeah. I don't know if it's relevant or not, but the Secret Service was initially established to, to for counterfeiting. It had right. nothing to yeah. do with Treasury. The They're absolutely mother. right. Yeah. Uh, because not even in modern day times, when I was when I was a security boss at the casino, whenever we got counterfeit money, that, that's who we had to call. We had to call the Secret Service. Ah. And they would have to come over and take the money, confiscate it. Usually, it's much easier nowadays. You have a form, you fill it out, you attach the money to it, you put it in an envelope, and you send it to it. They yeah. don't come over for everything, unless unless we uncovered, you know, a wad of it or a stash sure. of it. So yeah, the Secret Service is still involved in counterfeiting money, but Grant was the one that what that really started the Secret Service. So the South, the Confederacy. You have mentioned here that there was a, a, the Confederate Secret Service attacked Stuart. This must have been um, something out of the norm that the president of the Confederacy started because if you read stories about him, he was always in fear of his life for everything he'd done, every, everything he'd done. So um, the, the only ramification that you have listed here, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to list it and then I'm going to ask, so the only ramification you have listed here is that Lincoln's death pretty much affected the reconstruction of the South and made it worse. I will, I'll be honest that I meant to put more, uh, but I just kind of, things kind of got away from me. Where that's all right, because that's a state good testing. Point. <laughs> but you, you got to teach too. You got to work. Yeah, but that's a very good point. Is there anything else that we can attach to the, to all of this history that we, have now that or that has come and created changes and created things in, in, in our political lives. I can only speculate, but I, I think that had Lincoln survived, um, that Reconstruction probably would have been much kinder and more complete for the South. Yeah, I can only speculate. Clearly, I can't prove it. Well, Atlanta, Savannah, Mississippi, all yeah. of those places were, were, were torn by the torn up terribly by the war. And well, Savannah not... wasn't. What's that? The Savannah, Savannah was spared. wasn't. Oh, well, Savannah okay. was spared as a Christmas, as according to story, um, Sherman gave it as a Christmas gift to Lincoln. Um, so, and that's why Savannah is still has all its beautiful structures and still. Um, and it's very big. If you ever go to Savannah, that's that's very big part of the history that is what do you believe this point in history then? This is just a question, but do you believe this point in history then is what created the the terminology and the the governmental intervention called carpetbaggers? Yes, yes, I do. If you yeah, I mean because it opened carpetbaggers, uh, and in some cases they, they were also known as there was those scallywags. If you if you look at they this opened the door for people to come in and really take advantage of 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 a already of people that of an economic system that depended so highly on agriculture that one of Lincoln's plans was to re, really industrialize the South. Um, and it does not happen. Um, and the South and when all this stuff happens and people come down and take advantage and the radical Republicans are making all these rules. I mean, the fact where they were military districts instead of states for a while i mean think hunger games it was very much like that that's that's the best analogy i can give you was when they when they, that it made the south the people in the south a little bit bitter that honestly i think helped helped with that rise well i mean that's really and and i'm i'm not a i'm not a fan i'm not saying they were right but that was really the reason the kkk first started um was protect now I completely, I don't agree with anything. That's I'm saying it right now. Don't kick me off Facebook. All right, Facebook, because uh, I'm not, not saying, but that is really, it, it opened the door for that group. It opened the door for a very much a hatred. And I think 
what it did was it caused a greater division, even to this day in some cases, between the North and the South. Because you still have, well, the South's going to rise again. I was like, okay, you know, let's 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 settle that one down. But we there is still some of that in certain parts of the South where they look at the North as these you know, better than our high dirty bougie, in other words, kind of people. And I would say there are people in the North that kind of look at us as dumb rednecks, you know, that can't, can't tie our own shoes, you know. Thank I think, God for Velcro. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, I think with Lincoln's death, and, and I'm one of these people that believe that Lincoln actually would not have survived the second term. I think he was dying. If you look at if you look at the photographs of Lincoln from when he became president, how he aged, there is this huge theory that he was sick with something and he probably would not have survived a second term, just whether it be stress or whatever. Lincoln, though, could have set the way to really heal the country and found a way to to get the South up, because for the next I mean, next almost 100 for the next hundred years, progress in the South does not really happen. And, and about the only way you get out to really kind of make something is if you join the military. And that's why a lot of people, a lot of the military at the time was made up of Southern boys. Um, it just, it, it left a huge gap that only I think Lincoln could. But at the same time, you're sitting there, that's a speculation. It's like sitting there saying, well, what would the civil rights movement have been more like if King or Malcolm X had to been killed? And I had someone one time tell me he thinks they had to be. In order for certain things to happen, um, I don't know. So the, so the death, so, so the death of Lincoln. You, are you saying then that the death of Lincoln really basically had to happen so that things could happen, or are you saying that it happened despite what was going on and it and it made things worse? I think it, in the spite and it made it worse. Um, I, 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 I mean, I look at any kind of I look at any assassination honestly as and that's just me. Um, I look at any assassination as pointless. Um, listen, I, war happens, and I'm not I'm not stupid, but I you know I would figure that you know in a couple million years we've have how we've not figured out a better way to figure out some things. Sometimes I mean, look what's going on in the world right now. You know, there's the talk of a break of war right now. Uh, a, a, a like World War Three. All I've been seeing all all these past couple days, World War Three is going to happen. You know, well, how have we not figured out you know <laughs> some other way? Because, and I'll tell you why. The other part of what I said earlier about photography and written word and everything about history, and we speculate. When we study history, when we talk about history, we've used at least two of the three tools I tell everybody they have to use to understand and study history. One we haven't really used here is science. I don't think any science has creeped into our conversation. But the other two tools that, that you must use when you study history and try to understand it yeah. is the understanding of common sense and the understanding of human nature. And human nature is, is a big play in this entire piece of history. Human yeah. nature. And I think and I think you're very right about that. And I think and today when I hear some people how they will and Jeff, you could probably back me up on this, when I hear them recount things they think they know of history and stuff like I had a I'm gonna be honest, I had a student today tell me that you know Lincoln freed freed black people, but he didn't like them. And I couldn't that just we had a long discussion about where I was like, all right, what's, what's your evidence? And they were like, Oh, I, I heard it on TikTok. All right, now we got an issue. Okay, we got a big issue. Um, I'm like, why was it? And I, I'm a firm believer that you know Lincoln is very famous saying, "A house divided upon itself cannot stand." And he was talking about slavery is going to be accepted by all states, or it's going to have to end. Because and look what happened. It didn't. It, we fought. While I believe we fought the Civil War on states' rights, the biggest issue in states' rights was slavery. So which yes, was monetary, which was financial. Yeah. Of course, and and, and always, always, follow follow always follow the money. Always follow the money. It's all about and when when it ended, and then rightfully so, slavery should have ended. The it, it there were, everyone knew that there was going to be an economic almost for a collapse, and I think Lincoln was going to try to prevent that. Lincoln knew that all right, we got a whole society that's based on agriculture, and they're supplying. I mean, England almost joined the Civil War effort because we the South made almost made a deal with them. Said, hey, we'll we'll all we'll take all your cotton away if you don't join us in this war. 
that that I mean that is recorded, you know, <laughs> and it could have if they would have joined the Civil War might have changed differently. Completely. Well, of course different. it would have. Can I just talk some brief yeah. nuance at least about that TikTok contention that Lincoln freed enslaved blacks, but he didn't like them. First part's true. Second part is false. However, it can be construed at a quick glance that maybe Lincoln didn't think what he had a problem with, from my understanding of it, is that Lincoln, and this is, that's not the right way to put it, what he cons maybe was concerned about, he wasn't so sure that everybody could live together and get along. Um, and I don't know if that was, I don't, I'm not sure that he didn't believe or want that. I think it was a function of, I, he maybe, yeah. that he wasn't sure if it was a realistic hope. Um, and so, but I don't, I don't think that I've never ever read, heard, seen any kind of an account that he had racist intentions, that he believed one race to be better or worse than another. And in fact, one thing that stands out, even though it wasn't necessarily a comment about race, when he was a much younger man, long before he went into politics, he was at a slave market. He was he, he and a friend or two were walking past this where this was all going on. And, and you had people up there literally being bought and sold as, as like cattle, right. you know. And he said to his friends, he said, if I ever get a chance to hit that and he meant slavery, I'm going to hit it hard. Well, I will also say, like, one of the ways you could counteract with that with Lincoln's race, well, who was one of his top advisors? Frederick Douglass. He oh, had Frederick that's Douglass right. that's all true. the time. And if you don't, Frederick Douglass was one, is one of the most important people in, his, in American history. I, 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 I from the, White and black? Yeah, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I would say. I would say. And I no think, I, honestly, I don't think he's taught enough in schools. I don't think Frederick Douglass gets enough taught now in school. You know, he came to St. Augustine, right? Yeah, I don't so, think he knew that. Yeah, there's, a, there's a class on he had, he had Lincoln's ear. He had Lincoln's ear. He had conversations with Lincoln. I firmly believe that probably they, they and I would be willing to bet they talked. We know they talked about the issue of slavery. There's uh, a, there's a, and I'll probably get in trouble for saying this part. There's a news commentator that I listen to. His, his first name's Eric. I can't think of his last name. He's on Fox News. Um, and he has an evening show. And about four weeks ago, he was talking about Frederick Douglass. And he said that there were often times that he attended state dinners and affairs with Lincoln. And Lincoln would start the evening by telling everybody he was his, this was my, is my most trusted person that I talk to about certain things in front of all these other people. And uh, Eric, uh, why can't I think of his last name? He said it's it's documented that Lincoln really relied on Frederick Douglass for a lot of insight into a direction that that Lincoln himself really was unsure of, as you said. He didn't know. He wasn't, he wasn't sure. And, and just the story of Frederick Douglass, and I've had, and it's been a while since I've read the narratives and some of his letters. The story of Frederick Douglass, and this is kind of getting a little off there, but the story of Frederick Douglass is one of is one of the best things to learn. Do do hear this, to understand this man's story and where he come to go from go from pretty much being owned to to an advisor of the president. If you know, I mean, that's it's just it's, it's it's something that I think every every race should know and understand. Um, and it was, and wasn't because, honestly, it wasn't because he was white, because Frederick Douglass was brilliant. Frederick Douglass was one of the smartest men in that in the time period, and I would put him up against as one of the top top ten smartest men in, in American history. I would. Wow. Wow. Very interesting. Very cool. By the way, yeah, it's kind of not for me to say, but and I wish I could. My eyesight was better because I can't see. I can see that there are a lot of comments and maybe questions. Um, from from folks out there and i'm just kind of curious I'm like i can't what well, other people asking or saying, let's do this is that okay i'm just yeah kinda... actually there it is i need my glasses anyway oh that's where they went yep they went down there so we can do this i'm baby i'm going to wander all the way back to the beginning and since i have control uh, under our new program let's go all the way back and see if anything pops up that we can add to our conversation so there's zachary harper he actually is from michigan 
Uh, Cherry Madison is one of Miss, uh, uh, my son's students. Um, let's see. Uh, Panama City Beach. Uh, uh, I see most everybody. It's, this is at the beginning. Everybody just saying hello. Um, we got a note from OJ last night. Said send AC. <laughs> it's hot down here. Oh, <laughs> I saw a meme about about his, his, the day of his death. That the meme said that Ford Motor Company was going to donate a car for the lead car of his funeral procession oh, and boy. showed and showed a Bronco. It oh shit! Was... <laughs> wow. Uh, all right. Let's see. Uh, FDR. Jim said that F FDR was a good president, uh, and he did a lot too. You're absolutely right. Um, com compared to the many presidents who did nothing, we're better off with a president that does do something. I can't argue that one at all. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, I could be putting these up here like that. There, oh. Then we can see them. Can you see that, Jeff? I can, uh, that one I can that read, one you yeah. can see. Very good. Uh, Don't worry about me. I, you know, let's see. If you read them, I'll, I'll... They still teach civics is a question mark. So, And I have to tell people when I do tours in the museum and we talk about um, the pirate code and the, and the conversations of what kind of a government they had on the ship. I have to remind people that we're talking civics. We're not talking politics. Yeah. I, I tell people if we're talking politics, I would be naming names and parties. I don't name names and parties. I'm talking civics, the way things work. So let's see. And even uh, when it's come up tonight, once or twice, the phrase radical this, radical that, that's of that time, which has yeah. not, no resemblance to this day and age. Absolutely right. And it's completely different. And that's one of the other arguments that comes about with a lot of people um, that get really upset because of slavery, but they their focus is on everything in the past and their focus should actually be on today and the future mm. because we can't go back and change any of that. So, um, so one of our listeners, uh, 50 questions, multiple choice after the podcast. Here's the one that's interesting. Here's one. They, 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 they brutally destroyed the South. The South was maximum triggered. Slavery was about money. People spent all their money for slaves. No machines back then to buy. Um, pay them to free the slaves. So it was, you're right. It was a, with no industrial uh, industrialization coming to the South and everything was still done by hand, with the cotton and the sugar cane um, and all those things, it, it was going to be hard for the South to ever, ever pull out of all this. Um, By the way, so it sounds the like South there's a down. What's that? I said much of the South, I mean, here in Alabama, we have much, a lot of agriculture is Alabama's number one industry still. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I was going to say, and this is completely off topic, but if it sounds like there's a truck downshifting, it's uh, it's it's Captain's uh, cat Cooney here. Yeah, Cooney sitting over here purring, purring loudly. <laughs> um, so good, Mandy, good, good Mandy did put up a post there about Facebook, um, and the Facebook. So I, 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 I'll try not to say anything too ugly or mean, <laughs> because um, I don't want to have everything else torn apart because I say something off off handed. But it just seems to me that we're talking about something that is such an important part, and that one word created problems. Davey, I did see that you put it back up, though. You changed everything, right? Yeah, I just made it the death, of, and they were fine with that and, and put it back live. So so assassination know. is a bad word. Apparently death so. Right. If we start talking about the Titanic anniversary, don't <laughs> say iceberg. Yeah. Don't. <laughs> uh, uh, let's see. Um but it's all based on, I uh, see, and here's, if there was any point that I would have a problem with is this, it's based on um, algorithms and AI. There's not somebody there that, that looked at it and went, oh, okay, we understand, don't worry about it. The computer shut it down because there's no human intervention here. And that's, I think, what I have a problem with with some of this. Um, well, Skynet started in the Terminator, I'm telling you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So much for First Amendment rights and free speech. Well, up to a point, up to a point. Um, 
and, and we'll leave it at that for now. We might make a show on First Amendment rights and, and free speech. We may have to do something. Um, and Mandy just popped in there. Free speech has limitations. You cannot incite violence is one of them. You're absolutely right. Can't go into a theater. I, and also, free, free, a lot of people don't understand. I, I, my son can correct me here. Free speech mostly, our, our limitations or our expectations or our allowance of free speech is that we can say anything we want other than inciting violence against the government. The government has no, they can't do anything about us. It doesn't mean that I can't say all kinds of ugly things about you and get away with it. You're still responsible for what you say in all cases. The freedom of speech is just so the government can't come and take you yeah. and do yeah. something with you. That's, That's right. all free speech is. You can sue for libel or slander. Yes. Yeah, I mean, that was Voltaire. That was his big thing, you know, because he got put in prison a lot for that kind of thing. And so when Jefferson, you know, Jefferson then started writing something. Said, we got to have a way for our people to be able to go. Yeah, I think the president's an idiot, you know, <laughs> and not and not getting thrown in jail for it. And um, I agree. Go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. But at the same time, and I firmly believe, you know, we've always talked. I'll say this: we all have rights, you know, in this country. As long as your rights don't infringe upon someone else's rights, that is the important thing. People got it right. You can't force someone to do so, and. Free speech goes the same way. And I'll, I've had, and this is a discussion we have in my class because I have a lot of students believe that, um, that like, say, a white, um, what it was, a, was a white nationalist party or something like that, you know, a racist group shouldn't be allowed to have their Facebook groups or say what they want to say. And I said, well, you know, I'd rather them being able to say what they want to say and know where they're at <laughs> than them to be quiet and us not know where they're at until it's too late. You know, that's that's, how, a, that's one way to look at it. But you know, the other the other side of that coin is this. If you have groups that are filled with such hate and what they do, if you start the minute you start chipping away and telling this group they can't say this, they can't say this, that chipping away is going to happen to every group and that you chip away at that. And then no, nope, it, then it's going to become either all or none. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and that's the biggest argument that goes on now. And people are always, and and, and this is a like I've had people say, "Well, I don't want to be offended or anything." And I'm a big, I am, I'm a big fan of something that George, that Jordan Peterson said. In order to, and he said it, and I'm not going to get it right, but in order to learn, you have to risk being offended. And that means you have to hear people's other side. You have to hear, you have to hear other conspiracies. You have to understand there, you know, what other people think about the Lincoln assassination or how the reconstruction could have done that. You have to hear other people's thoughts and ideas because it not only can maybe change yours, but at the same time, uh, strengthen your conviction of what you believe. Um, and that's the only, that's the only way society really evolves is when people are talking to each other, uh, and having disagreements, but not like fighting. But disagreements. And here's here's where it falls into 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 my life. Being a comedian, when I first started doing comedy in the '80s and the '90s, everything was okay. Mm -hmm. And now, nothing. You have to be very careful what you say, and that's why some comedians have dropped out of the world. They 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 don't do comedy clubs anymore. A very good friend of my family one time many years ago pointed out, and I happen to agree with him, that all humor is at someone's expense. It is. It, it just is by its very nature. And if you can laugh at it, it probably could or at least conceivably would have been, if it is not all presently, uh, offensive to somebody. That doesn't mean that it's always with ill intent. And I think the intent is, is, where, is where the rubber touches the road on that. Um, so... So there's that. To I, I know many comedians that, uh, and some of them famous ones, and their comedy is, is is fantastic. And none of their comedy is ill intent. None of their comedy is malicious. Their comedy is just making fun of society as a whole. Have you ever watched Family Guy? Yes. Lord, if you aren't offended in one half hour of that show, you're not paying attention. Something in that half hour is going to offend something about you or something you identify with. But there are no sacred cows. And that's where I think a show like that, I can laugh at it because it's so over the top that it doesn't pretend not to be. 
and it doesn't pretend to be serious or that it or that it, I don't think Seth MacFarlane really wants people to take it all that seriously. But another coming back to a point, not so much being offended, but something you were talking about, Will, is that for me, in general, there's nothing that is satisfies for me anyway, quite like that moment. And there have been hundreds, if not thousands, in my life when somebody presents a point of view that not only challenges mine, but makes me realize that mine could could not be the only definitive, even yeah. though, no, that can only be this way. Like, no, there's, I've thought about it. Oh, no, I, I thought I thought about it. And somebody says, no, yeah, but you don't, you haven't thought of this or you aren't aware of this. Those moments, they're humbling, but they're also so liberating. I mean, so, so when I do, going back to my tours, when we talk about, because so many people have this set idea on how pirates really were. And most everybody's set ideas on how pirates really were. It's, it's really not very close. Mm -hmm. it's, it's way off. And and I tell people, I, 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 I'm going to say things, and it, ha it happens tonight. We've said some things. I'm going to say things that you may not believe in or you may not agree with. But, and this is where our rights come in. We live in the greatest country in the world. You're entitled to your voice, your words, your thoughts, and your opinions, and nobody should take that away from you. Right or wrong, the best part about conversations like this with history is you will get those aha moments, as I refer to them. Mm -hmm. You're dead set in, in the thought process you have, and somebody brings something to your attention, and you go, ah, ah, because I believe that a difference of opinion in history and sometimes in politics, it's harder in politics, but I think a difference in opinion in certain things should always be the opening of a door for conversation. It should never be the pulling of weapons to kill people. Mm -hmm. And that's what's going on all the time. It, it, that's, that's why this country is 50-50 divided right now, really. And when a country makes it to that point of 50-50 divided, it's hard to accomplish anything. And, and a lot of it is because people say, you don't believe in what I believe in. I don't want anything to do with it. I've had great conversations with people that don't believe in what I believe in, but because they have adult tendencies to have a good conversation too, we can disagree. We don't have to change each other's minds. We just have to make each other think. When, when I said I find it liberating in those moments, part of that is because it liber I feel liberated from the need to be right. Yes. It's, and that's because it's a heavy yoke to, to, to carry around, even if you don't realize you're doing it. No, no, I'm right. No, no, I, I, I got it figured out. Other people are idiots or whatever. Oh, no, 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 no. I don't need to be right. Oh, good. I can. I don't have to have all the answers. No, we don't have to have all the answers. And a conversation makes it much easier. So let's see, rolling down through here. Uh, Zachary Harper, professional new. Most reporting is all done by a computer. It is only as smart. It's probably not programmed to look for context. Okay, I'll get that. Uh, we are discussing a factual past event. It's not a rally cry to action. The sure haven't done anything when segments of society to decide it is time to go after police officers. All right, yeah, yeah you're right. Let's see. Um, Mandy Jo says she doesn't want to be smarter. <laughs> uh, but Mandy, that's why I have you on the show. You're smarter than I am. No, I don't want it to be smarter. Oh, okay. It's typed okay. wrong there. I don't want AI to get too much smarter because if it's yeah. kicking you out for assassination and it starts hitting more stuff, just like I want to say Zachary Harker said, Skynet's or next hit there. Yeah. Well, that just proved, though, just how obtuse artificial intelligence and air quotes on the intelligence part of that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, it's it's never going to be smarter than you. No. Nope. <laughs> so I see a couple more of your students in there. Did you catch that, now, uh, Bill? Uh, yeah, I saw some. Yeah, I see some of them. I see yeah. a couple more of your students. I see, I see some of them. I see some of them has not still can't spell my last name right. <laughs> um, are they getting extra credit for watching the show? Uh, I haven't decided yet. I told you know I, uh, I they're they're working on a project right now that's worth two test grades. So <laughs> I think they're getting plenty of credit for me right now. So. Uh, no. Well, I'll tell you what. If they start watching the show on a regular basis, I'll give them a couple of words 
um, in, in their favor towards you. That sounds good. We need more and more people. Um, what's this one here? Lincoln was against slavery, but there are some questionable views on how he felt about blacks. He suggested sending them back to Africa. Um, 1855 letter doesn't support equality. Mm -hmm. um, I had heard the first part. I'd heard that before. Have you ever heard that? I, got, yeah. I had heard that he had thought that maybe the best way to solve this problem was to send everybody back. But was it, hold on, but was it, and, if, and Jeff, you might know too, but I've always understood it in some readings. The thought process behind this was if I free slaves, that's 400 million people all of a sudden free. What will it, and he, and he was kind of thinking like on a business side, is it better to help them start something new or, you know, what would happen to the economy? I mean, there was all these things. I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm not, I'm not arguing with, uh, Profet knew on this. I'm just giving another point that some historians believe that Lincoln was looking more at the economic side of the country, what would have happened. Because, I mean, overnight, the population of the United States grew. Our citizens. <laughs> well, that's, that's, citizenship. that is exactly why the plan of 40 acres and a mule went into effect. It yeah. was to send them all west to send everybody to the other side of the Mississippi River, past Missouri, into everything, all the way to California. That is exactly where 40 mules and a, 40 acres and a mule came up. And um, it, it did send a huge amount of the population. And it wasn't just, it, 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 was, it was for everybody. Um, and a lot of people took advantage of that. And I'm not sure whether the, that number one there about suggesting sending um, blacks, free blacks back to Africa, I'm not sure that that was anything about a forced deportation by yeah. I, I that and I don't know no, I don't I admit I, I don't know but I can't it seems hard for me to imagine that Mr. Lincoln would have thought that way uh, or thought it to be useful and I don't mean in a hateful hateful way I, I don't think that that was part of his 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 persona anyway but but um, even as it. I, it doesn't. It doesn't seem like it. And it's been, a speculative it been, thought. Yeah, maybe it would have been an offer to say, "Hey, look, if you want to go back to Africa, we will." And again, I'm speculating. Maybe that there would have been some kind of um, um, so I, payment for that. To, what for is that to the happen. 1855 letter? Is that a famous document or an important document? I, I've heard of it. Um, I, I'm going to be honest. I'm not going to really. I'm going to look that one up. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to look it up now, but I'm going to look that one up. Lincoln, if, if, if we're going to say that, then, you know, Lincoln, but also like W.E.B. W -E -B du Bois, who's, you know, started NAACP, he wanted the same thing. Like, he was a pro for that. So we can, I mean, it's throughout history. And I, I mean, I know I'm sorry, like, I feel like I'm, all of a sudden I'm defending sending, you know, Lincoln sending people to another country. <laughs> I'm not. But I, again, it goes back to how we're looking at history. I mean, you're taking one man and one of those things. There, he was not the only person at that time. So why are we why are we sitting there saying this? And there's a lot of controversial to that, from what I understand, of that letter, of what was he really trying to mean? What was he looking at? And I think you have to look into that. Um, I'm, you know, was it, I, I know that this country we have not gotten it right all the time. Uh, I mean, that, and that's that's part of being a patriot. Is you understand, they there are things that happen in the country, and you don't always get it right, but you work to better. Okay, so. But that, I'm going to stop right there because I feel like, yeah, if you want perfection, else, you I don't want I don't want to get into something else right now. If, if you want perfection, you come to the wrong planet. <laughs> Sorry, just that's true. Well, how about a, I'll close it with this, and then we're going to go ahead and because Davey always puts together a really good this week in history, and so we may pop that in real quick. <laughs> Government is supposed to be run. The responsibility of, of government is to run the country by the will of the people. That's what I keep telling everybody. The responsibility of the politicians in office, both the president, the Congress, which is House and Senate, is to run the country by the will of the people. They are supposed to get along and not be selfish in their decisions on how they do things. And that is a human trait that is hard to take away from people. Yeah. yeah. I, think, I think we forget that life is too short for some of the battles we get caught up in. That's true. Thank you. Very much so. Very much so. Well, it's been a good discussion. I can say that. Um, let's see here. i got a couple more here. That, uh, uh, 
And Nightingale and Florence just walked in too. <coughs> uh, you know what we didn't talk about? Um, YouTube, Mount Vernon, a tongue-in-cheek reenactment of what slavery was like at Mount Vernon, played by an African woman acting as a slave. It's called Ask the Slave Informative. Uh, I'll have to look that one up. Sounds interesting. You know what we didn't talk about? Let's do it real quick. So everything we talked about tonight is being made into a movie. Yeah. And we didn't talk about that. Oh, Manhunt. Yeah. Manhunt. And <laughs> it's supposed to come out in 2025? I think it's supposed to come out this year. Really? So um, I don't know anything about it, but I'm going to have to look it up. Do you know any of the stars that are going to be in it? Any of the celebrities that are going to be put in position of, of, of the... Because the, the main characters will probably be, for sure, Booth. Booth, Harold. Harold, uh, Surratt. Yep. Um, and I guess... So will the... So you've seen previews of this already? Well, I'm sorry. It's not a movie. I just actually wanted to double check. It's not a movie. It's going to be a television miniseries. Oh, that's right. That's oh. what I heard about. Yeah, I, oh. think, I, I think, is it going to be on Netflix or uh, I can't see? Uh, Apple TV, I think. Apple, that's Apple right. TV. That's it. Oh, yeah. Well, I guess so, I'm using Apple TV for a little bit. I guess so. So yeah. it's going to go from the assassination of Lincoln to for so basically it's going to be about the 12 weeks of this entire oh yeah certainly those 12 days between yeah. between assassination and capture of, of booth and, and harold uh and probably yeah because i have to put the it, trial in it to establish context yeah. because here's uh, the thing is that that the book manhunt is written by james swanson who co-authored this book um and so in that book uh, We've talked about it. I can't remember if it was before or during the show tonight, but um, that's an excellent narrative that gets into very, very good detail about all of that. But of course, it's not just those 12 days. It's that it's broader context. Well, I'm, I'll, I'll look forward to that and we'll post information about that when we get in any more information. So if any of our watchers and listeners and followers are interested in this subject that we've had a good time with, um, then we'll make sure everybody knows about it because it might just open the door for another conversation, another show. Very much so. Davey, you got um, This Week in History ready? Ah, oh, there, there it is right there. I guess I'm going to have to get Apple TV now. So I don't know who that actor is, but that is John Wilkes Booth. Very depicted in anyway. Yeah. Well, we'll have to we'll have to watch for that. Good job, Davey. Mm. Uh, go ahead and put up This Week in History, sponsored by Dick's Wings. And if you want a really good lunch, I have it right here. Look at this, ladies and gentlemen. They got a great menu. Good wings of many flavors. There's about 20 different flavors here. They good. They do a great hamburger for lunch, and they do a really great hot dog. They have four foot long hot dog meals. It's a it's a meal in itself. If you want a good good time for good food, go to Dick's Wings up here on US One outside of the shores. On that note, Davy. This Week in History, please. Welcome to This Week in History. Sponsored by our good friends at Dick's Wings Bar and Grill. Wings, salads, wraps, quesadillas, and more. No matter what your taste buds crave, they've got you covered. We begin This Week in History in the year 1817. First American School for the Deaf opens Hartford, Connecticut. 1861. Federal, Federal Army 75,000 volunteers mobilized by U.S. President Abraham Lincoln, U.S. Civil War. 1775, American Revolution begins in Lexington, Massachusetts. The shot heard around the world takes place later that day in Concord. 1783, American Revolution, George Washington issues general order announcing the end of hostilities with Britain giving thanks to the Almighty and offering congratulations and authorizing an extra ration of alcohol to the troops to celebrate. 1860. Champion of England Tom Sayers and American John Heenan fight out brutal two-hour and 27-minute draw near Farnborough, England. Police stop fight acknowledged as a first world title bout. 1865. Abraham Lincoln dies nine hours after he is shot by John Wilkes Booth 
while attending the play Our American Cousin at Ford's Theater in Washington. 1906, San Francisco earthquake and fire kills nearly 4,000 while destroying 75% of the city. 1922, Annie Oakley sets woman's record by breaking 100 play targets in a row. 1927, actress Mae West found guilty of obscenity and corrupting the morals of youth in a New York stage play entitled Sex. She is sentenced to 10 days in prison and fined $500. The resulting publicity launches her Hollywood career. 1955, Ray Kroc opens his first McDonald's Incorporated fast food restaurant in Des Plaines, Illinois. 1986, Geraldo Rivera opens Al Capone's vault on live TV and finds nothing, except great ratings for his spectacle. 1993, action TV series Walker, Texas Ranger, starring Chuck Norris debuts on CBS. 2004, Rock for the Rainforest Benefit Concert held at Carnegie Hall, New York City. Performers include Sting, Elton John, James Taylor, Billy Joel, Bette Midler, and Little Jimmy Scott. And finally, in 2019, Paris Cathedral, Notre Dame, catches fire, toppling its spire and destroying its roof. And that was This Week in History. Good job, Davey. As always, great points. I hope that uh, some of your students picked up on some of those points of history. Um, many of them are, are very pertinent to everything that's going on today. Guest on deck, Davey. Do you have that? I do. Uh, good. Yep. So here's a couple of things. What's that? Go ahead. There. Mini Mayhem uh, unfortunately took over nautical in this week. Sorry about that. That's all right. It sounded good to me. So we just did the, um, with Will the Historian and our guest Jeff Vane on Lincoln's demise. I won't use the other word now. <laughs> his, his, his forced death. Uh, something like that. Gary Sass is going to be with us next Monday. In fact, he just texted me this morning or this afternoon for a potential job. So I've got to double check that he's going to be here next week. Um, Bold City Brewery and the, the silent movie museum that's up there. Did you know that Jacksonville was like the original Hollywood of the movie world? No, I did not know that. Yes. I knew about Marine Land for some yep. shame, but um silent movies and a huge um black influence of movies up there in Jacksonville. So we're gonna mm -hmm. talk about that next week. May 6th, Miss Gina, World Belly Dance Day. July 8th, the birth of Superman. Those are the ones we know we have coming up, and we're now working on bringing in a couple of other guests for some other dates. The sheriff will be here of St. John's County, and I'm actually trying to get a very, very, very lovely lady named Jessica Clark. You know her, right? Heard her name. Heard her name? Yeah, yeah. I, it, she's, she's got some name quality around here. <laughs> we're going to try to get her on the air and, and, and be on a show. Davey, um, my thought on that one is because because uh, Jessica Clark has to do shows on live TV Monday through Friday. We can't pull her in for a Monday. So I was thinking I'm going to be gone on a Monday in May for that cruise. If we could bring her to the house and do a Sunday show, just tape it, and then you would have it for that Monday night. Okay. That would be an easy one to do. Unless you had another idea, that would be an easy one to do and cover, cover our issues and our situation. Yeah, so I'm going to check and see if she's available, and we'll let you know. On that note, let's reveal the joke of the week with Minnie Mayhem. Okay, it's time for the answer to the joke of the week. How do pirates pay for Ronda Rum at the pub? The answer is with bar nickels. <laughs> uh... <laughs> Yeah, I'm glad you like it. We got to get a snare drum in here. I'll tell you, yeah. we need a snare drum sound effect or something. So um, we always like to give thank yous to everybody. And then after the thank yous, I want to give each one of our guests an opportunity to uh, say a couple of words and say, say their whatever they'd like to close the show. But first, let's go with our thank you video. 
Captain's Quarters podcast is indeed a ship sailing the seas of the world, always in search of history, knowledge, and adventure. It takes a crew to run a ship, so we take this opportunity to thank those who help keep this ship afloat. The casting crew, Captain William Mayhem, Navigator Davy Longwood, Gunner Hellfire Henley, Cartographer Mandy Joe, the Powder Monkey, and Juan Cam. Helping others gives a crew purpose. Our treasured charities that we support. Inc. Investing in Kids. The Humane Society of St. John's County. Alias Acres, a no-kill animal rescue zone. And the Cadets of the St. John's County Fire Department. The four major charities that we support but there's always room for more. You too can be part of the crew and support this show in many ways. Go to Patreon, a small monthly contribution as Potter Monkey or First Mate memberships, or a single contribution. PayPal or Venmo. Go to YouTube, hit the like and follow buttons to join our ranks and support the show. It does take a crew. Thank you. Very good. There's our platforms, ladies and gentlemen. YouTube, every Monday night at 8 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. As soon as the show cans, it'll download to Spotify and Instagram. If you just want to listen to us because you don't want to look at my ugly mug, right? <laughs> then you can catch us on Stitcher, iHeart, CastBox, Apple Podcast, and Music Amazon or Amazon Music. Seven, eight platforms. Eight. Eight platforms. Very good. And... Numbers. Show our numbers. Are they changed? Let's see if our numbers are growing. job our numbers that, that, that our numbers of, of subscribers jumped up by 10 from last week so we have thought somebody gave us an idea last week I think it was Jim that if we when we get to our 1565th subscriber that number means something to people here in St. Augustine that we have to do something for that person I'm not sure what we're going to do but it'll be a good number to hit and then from there who knows what we're going to do upon that note uh, Jeff, you got anything you want to say in closing? We well, always like to give our, our, our guests. Oh, and, and as, as you, before I, you, you do that, we always, and, uh, my son, I need your, at your mailing address. We always give every one of our guests, one of these, it's like a token chip. It's like a drink coin. It's got our part of our logo on it and our sign off and it's a black poker chip. I love it. Yes. We I give one it. to every one of our guests. Now, black in Vegas means $100. It's not worth $100. Don't worry. That's about right. it. It's still worth more than what I had in my pocket right there now. There you go. So I, now my son's been on the show twice, so I need to send him two. And we have a red one and a black one, and I want to make sure I send them to him. So that's what we like to give. So I give you the floor for just a few seconds there. Just to say thank you. I've had so much fun. And peace to everybody. You got, another, you got another point in history that you like besides this one? I'd have to kind of search to kind think of think about it, it because for sure. But but this one, for whatever reason, we has... we like I like repeat guests coming on. Um, I like it because they enjoyed it the first time, so they would enjoy it the second time. And I want to make sure that we bring you back if you'd like to do another episode or something. My son being a history teacher, we did D Day. We're going to do Superman. We, we just... did. Uh, this, this is this is my fourth time. I think I might hope be. Your uh, most frequent guest. Uh, you might be. Uh, we've done two things in Pearl Harbor. We've done. We did. Oh, D-Day. that's right. D Day, yeah. Pearl Harbor, Lincoln. Yeah, Who Lincoln. says nepotism doesn't work? <laughs> <laughs> Especially in pirates. That's right. right. So, you got anything you want to say, or say something to your 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 students that are watching? 
I just want to thank everybody for watching. Thank, uh, thank you for the opportunity to, you know, I always, I've always loved when you let me uh, give me a chance to kind of dive into history with, you know, and dive into doing something other than, you know, preparing a lesson, even though I love what I do. I love preparing lessons. I love, I love research too. I love doing the research and uh, thank you, Jeff, for coming on um, and, and, and helping with this and helping and, and helping me see some points and actually some things that I hadn't even thought about. So that's always, always a fun thing. And uh, thank thank everybody out there for having me on again. All right. You must not be too, old, too tired of me yet. Make sure your dad tells me when you're coming to town because I'd love to meet you in person. Yeah, well, we're, 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 we're working on it. There's a there's a lot of going on and we, we, we keep trying to plan a date. But uh, as dad knows, there's some things that my wife and I are working on right now that may hinder some travel in the near future. Um, so we're working on that, but get the travel trying. done now so that you don't have to worry down the road. But yeah, yeah if you come back down, we'll we'll go hit a hit a brewery and a, and, and the distillery. I do <laughs> owe my wife a beach trip for putting up with me and going to this Comic Con thing. Really, kind of as on our anniversary weekend, um, <laughs> you know, around our anniversary weekend. So I, I I told her I owe her a beach trip for. for so we got beaches here. We do have beaches and here. You know what? We they're do. right next to the ocean. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I, here, yeah, I know. Uh, so <laughs> when does school start in in August for you guys, or does it start in September? Like, um, it starts in August. Um, it starts in August for us. I usually have to report like usually the last week of July. Okay. All right. Um, things done. So, so August is out for you to take a trip. May, who knows? Maybe sometimes we try to take a trip, um, around her birthday. So it's her birthday. Uh, 25th of August. Is it really? Yeah. Kara's is the twenty fourth. You should just bring her down here, and we'll just do a we'll do a, a McCray birthday for our for our wonderful women. There we go. We could do that. I think we could work on that. Work on yeah. that. Work on that. And uh, I see about flying that that drive last time. Whew. <laughs> What's the longest <laughs> so drive? Work on it because uh, I'll tell you. I'll tell you later. Um, we've already started making plans, but I think I can convince the uh, the big boss of the resort hotel out there on the beach to. Throw a little extra into the kitty and see what I can do. All right. All so right. Work on that. That day. Yeah. Kara's birthday is the 24th. I think the weekend after that or the weekend before is when we're going to do something because 24th and 25th is in the week. So let's see what we can do. And then you can meet my son. I'm proud of him. Um, we, without being too much into our past, we didn't get to spend a whole lot of time together as father and son. Um, and, and I'll shoulder most of that blame. Well, I will. Well, I'm, but, a, I'm, I'm a big fan of you. That's nothing new. And now I'm a new fan of you. Do you go by Bill or Will? Because I think I go by I go I started I I go by William. Um, because there were too many bills. Okay, there were too many bills in my family. When he was so, growing up, I used to call him Little Bill, but I can't call him Little Bill anymore because he's bigger than I am. Uh, well, like, well, dad was Bill, my grandpa was Bill. I had an yeah. uncle Bill from Louisiana, and I think it just got confused. So when I turned 18 and went off to college, I went by William, and it freaked some people out. Like, my mom would call my job and be like, I need to speak to Bill, and it's like, we don't have anyone here by that name, and they would hang up on her, uh, because <laughs> they knew me by William. And Lauren, my wife, only knows me by William. She thinks it's weird if I, someone calls me Bill. But if you hear, if I get called Bill or Billy, that means it's someone I went to high school with. That's, <laughs> yeah. That's well, let's work on that date in August. That would be a lot of yeah. fun. We could do it all together. That would be a lot of fun. I think it would be, be wonderful. Well, it's been a good show. We have the email going across the bottom. If you have ideas for the show, you're the leader of a group, pirate group, charity group, and you need some extra face time to promote your event, let us know. I do it this way. I mean, sometimes I find groups that I, I will offer an opportunity to, but sometimes it's just easier because I don't know everything that's going on out there. As much as my, most people might think I know, I don't. So if you've got something going on, send us a message. Let's put you either on the show or at least figure a way to advertise your event and talk about it. It's very important to us. And in that note, ladies and gentlemen, we always have our sign off. Take it away, Davey. Part of the podcast. Part of the crew.
always. We can't do it without you, our listeners, and our followers. And you're the reason we do it. Not for me, not for them, for you. Thank you very much. We'll see you next Monday at 8 p.m. Bye.